to show you something that I, you, most of you know, like Cheyenne and Dusty, because I talk about them all the time. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, they're at school. And today, this morning, Cheyenne woke up and said, I'm coming to your Bible study today. And I was like, yeah, well, we're kind of playing a video of you, okay? What about us? It was so funny that came over Instagram and it was like the face of Dusty was like, serious? Okay, I can put that up there. So we just laughed hysterically and I thought, oh, I got to show you guys my kids. So fiber. If you're young, uh, under 40, you have no idea what fiber does to you. Okay, but my husband tells me the other day, you need to like uh, put fiber in your system. And I'm like, yeah, I'm way too young for that. Okay, hang on a second. Let me get this off of here and then however this plays out. So, is, tell me when that goes up. Is that all the way up up there? Okay. Just the blue screen. Ah. Tell me when it goes away. Is it gone? No. All right, whatever. Okay, so fiber. So but Rob tells me that he's like, you know, Lisa, you really need to get on fiber. It helps you. If you're under 40, you're like, what is fiber? It just kind of, I don't know. I can't believe we're telling this in Bible study. It helps you go to the bathroom, okay? So it just makes it easier, whatever. So he says, let's, let's get on some pills. So for me, a pill is like, I don't do pills and I don't do shots. So we get, we you just know that right off the bat. So in order for me to take these pills, I have to like eat a whole thing of peanut M&Ms. So I eat M&Ms, shove the pill in, swallow it. And, and then if that doesn't work, I have to eat it with a banana. Okay, so you, you chew up a banana and then you shove the pill in. So I got all these ways to eat pills. So we're walking along in Costco. I don't even know if I'm allowed to do this on TV or whatever we're doing. Uh, and I found Fiberwell gummy bears. Okay, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this works two a day keep something away. I don't know what. Anyway, so I walk out into the kitchen and there's Dusty sitting with this thing open going, these are so good, mom. And I was like, oh yeah, that's not what you're supposed to be doing with those. So yeah, I have adorable children. So Okay, welcome. Uh, today, you were supposed to have a really, really lengthy letter sitting in front of you, which you don't. Because I want to tell you guys the state of the ministry, because a lot of people have no idea. Like, you come here, but you don't realize, like, what goes into this and how God has done some really great things since we started from 14 years ago to now. So, we had this really cool letter, and it was, like, 12 pages long and really pretty font, and, and so that was going to be, I was going to, I wanted to tell you everything in the letter, but it took 20 minutes, and we said, we're not doing that at Bible study. So, somebody last week said, put in a letter form. Great idea. So, we did that. Last night, I get a phone call from my printer. I was picking him up this morning. She said, did you happen to edit this? And I'm like, yeah, we did. We edited the whole thing. Her word, we, they were all printed, a hundred of them. They're really pretty, and they're really nice, and a hundred of them she said she opened it just on the sheer chance to see what it said inside of it and there was word after word after word that was missing the last letter so when they copy and pasted my word to their doc their system it took out all of these it was a nightmare so i'm like well so i'm going to tell you a little bit about it and the next week you get to see the whole thing and it'll be online and all that stuff but the whole reason why i wanted you to know about what's going on here is because i want you to be really excited that that this Bible study is now going out into basically the world, if you can even believe that. I got an email or a message the other day saying, I am from Malaysia and I want to know how I can join your Bible study. So it's online now and it's on YouTube and people are being able to find us from all over with the Roku, with everything else we're doing now with the apps. So I wanted you to see that the reason why it is the way it is now is because you guys like show up here every Wednesday morning. And so I want to thank you for doing that because if you didn't, it would be David and my husband would probably show up, but he hears me blah, blah, blah all the time. And so he probably would do it just to support this whole thing. But they don't, David and Rob don't think I'm that funny. <laughs> so like they wouldn't laugh at my jokes like you guys did. So then David would have to get like a laugh track and you know, it would be a bad deal. So I'm really, really thankful that you guys get out of bed in the morning because there's a lot of different ways you can watch this thing. And, and it's easier to stay, you know, at home and flip on your TV and do all that. So I'm thankful for you. And because of you, 
all of these other things are happening now, and I was so excited to, to share it with you. Part of what you're going to see is what it costs to run this ministry. We never talk about money. If you're here and you're new and you're like, oh, yeah, another well, I want some money. We never do this because God always, always provides. But I want you to see, like, all the costs that it costs just to put this on. And now that we're going out, it's, it's very, very expensive. I was telling someone last week, I said, we did the marriage conference in here, and it cost us almost $3,000 just to put that on for four weeks. Like, and, and she's like, you're kidding? I never knew that. So I, we just want you to know and if you can help in any way like we're just trying to find people to come alongside of us and say i like this ministry and i would love to be able to support it for you know a dollar a month whatever (laughs) hopefully more than that but that's okay so it'll give you our budget it'll tell you exactly what we spend money on each week and so you'll get that next week so i want to just tell you that but I do want to talk to the people who watch us on Roku because I'm going to tell you something that, that I didn't know. That, and for the, those here, Roku is a box that you actually put on your TV and you can watch tons and tons of stations. Um, and, and it's really free. So like when I found the Roku, I, I, you go to the religious section and you can watch all of these really great pastors, Andy Stanley and Craig Rochelle and Max Licato and all these people. So I was enthralled. So I would just sit there for hours and hours and hours and watch on all these people so I could learn. And when we decided to get our Roku channel, when they sent us a contract, what I didn't realize is that every time the end user gets on and watches, we get the bill. So I was like, ah. So every month, anyone who's watching Roku, we get the bill for that. And we're thrilled and we're so excited for that. But if you are on Roku and you can help us, um, you can do that through going to Connect with Faith dot com and there's a donate button on there and all that but roku just for you guys listening we've had almost thirty thousand viewers in the last six months on roku we're having about five thousand people a month going i know it's the coolest thing ever and then our website which is all in there we've got we've had i think thirty six thousand people in the last six months go to our website to either watch online or what so it's so fun that god's doing these incredible things and i always say it's because you guys get out of bed and show up here so thank you for that and I want you to know that. So, okay. Next week we'll have that. Oh, and just a little FYI, we always tell you this. Rob and I take no money out of this. I know I told you I did pay back that dollar for the payday that I did buy. But, um, <laughs> But we don't take any money out. 90% of it all goes into this ministry to advertise, to get people the books and binders and, and just the rental. There's so much that goes into this. And um, 10% goes to Feed My Starving Children and Hope for Kids. So we're building a well. We're almost done building our first well, and I'm kind of excited about that. So it costs a lot of money, and if you can do anything, great. And we will never talk about that, although next week I'll just hand you your thing and you can read it yourself. So, okay, last week we finished our lesson on uh, the 12 disciples, and we're just going to move on. We were going to move on. And then I got this idea that I want to talk about what it means to be a disciple. And so that's kind of where we've been going these last couple of weeks. Like what, what does it mean to be a disciple? Because we're, we're, we know how to go to church and we know how to put a church sticker on our car, but I'm not certain that we know what the Bible says it means to be a disciple or a follower of Christ. And so we, we studied these men, uh, the, the 12, and I realized, like, am I like them? Do I follow Jesus like they follow Jesus? And if not, why not? What is, what is the problem here? So today we're going to hit on one main point towards, towards the end. So I think the problem is, is that we get hung up, and we've talked about this the last couple of weeks, what the word um, Christian means, because it's so overused, and if you're an American, you think you're a Christian, or if you go to church on Easter, you're convinced you're a Christian. And yet, the Bible never called people Christians except three times. And one of them is right there in your um, handout. Uh, Acts 11.26 was the first time the word Christian was even used. It was years after Jesus was, you know, crucified, resurrected, ascended to heaven. So now you have this word that, that... that is finally used, and when they found him, Barnabas was looking for Paul, he brought him to Antioch, and for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now, before they were called Christians, they were called disciples. That's just what they were. And, And the word disciple is used 269 times in the New Testament. So when you and I as followers of Jesus, instead of saying I'm a Christian because that word just could mean anything, what we really are, if you've given your life to Christ, is this idea of a disciple. And so we want to see what they did so that we can follow their example. So first let's find out what the word disciple means in your handout. 
you have uh, from Easton's dic- uh, Bible Dictionary. This is what he says a disciple is. A disciple is one, believes his doctrine, two, rests on his sacrifice, three, imbibes, takes in his spirit, and four, imitates his example. So those are what makes up a disciple, but I actually like what um, the next one, Holman's Illustrated Bible Dictionary says, because it gives us a bigger parameter here. He says, a follower of Jesus Christ, especially the Commission 12 who followed Jesus during his earthly ministry, the term disciple comes to us in an English from a Latin root. Its basic meaning is learner or pupil. In the Greek word, the word disciple normally referred to an adherent of a particular teacher or religious philosophical school. It was the task of the disciple to learn, study, and pass along the sayings and teachings of the master. In rabbinic Judaism, the term disciple referred to one who was committed to the interpretations of scripture and religious tradition given him by the master or rabbi. Through a process of learning, which would include a set meeting time and such pedagogical methods as question and answer, instruction, repetition, and memorization, the disciple would become increasingly devoted to the master and the master's teaching, and in time, the disciple would likewise pass on the traditions to others. Okay, so if that is what a disciple means, then we have to put that up against our life and say, is that me? Do I do those kind of things? Not am I a, a Christian, but am I a disciple who studies who is increasingly devoted to his master's teaching, which for us that would be Jesus. And then once we learn all this stuff, now we're so excited of everything we've learned, now we want to pass it on to somebody else. Um, It also says that people spend time learning and memorizing. They go to meetings, so I say that church, Bible study, I mean, that's just what they do. They... um, And they do it with the intent of learning so that they can pass it on to someone else. So that's kind of what that means. Most of you know last week we talked about Katie Wagner, uh, this little 17-year-old who ended up dying last week of cancer. But it was so amazing that in her short 17 years of life, she, that was what she did. She studied, she loved Jesus, she desperately wanted uh, him in her life and all of her friends. So when she, right before she passed away, she told her dad that she wanted him, them to share the gospel and then anyone who wanted to be baptized right after the service would go and her dad would baptize them. And I think it was 42, I think Chris is, I think that was what it's, 42, 45 people went and got baptized that day. So that is what a disciple does. It's like, I am so excited in life or whether I'm going to die, that eternity is so important to me that you go with me that I'm going to spend my time telling you about it because that's just what disciples do. So Rob and I were talking the other day and I, I realized something about teaching especially this, because when you start telling people there's a big difference between I'm a Christian and I'm a disciple, there's almost this line, and there's this fine line because people will be like, well, my friend says she's a Christian and she doesn't want anything to do with God, but she asked Jesus in her heart, and she believes in Jesus, but nothing's ever changed, so she's a Christian. And, and there's this really fine line, and Rob said, Lisa, we've we got to be careful to tell people both sides. So I was driving along and all of a sudden it hit me what my problem is because the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And you're like, great. So there's a lot of people out there that go to church Christmas and Easter that believe in Jesus. They just do. And we're like, okay, they believe in him. But then that verse came to me, James 2.19 in your handout. He's talking, you believe that that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. So it dawned on me that we have this, this idea of, of belief that demons believe too. So there has to be a difference between this mental, I believe, and this heart, I believe, because this belief in my heart changes everything in my life. This belief in my head doesn't change anything. One is a true disciple, a true follower of Christ. The other one, is, it, it, it doesn't, they don't understand that. And so what we want to do here is make sure that we're, not, that we're Christians in the right sense, the disciples. Okay, so anyway, what we want to do here is make sure, because I do not want anyone to be deceived. I want everyone to know what it really, really honestly means to be a true follower of Jesus, because I don't find in the Bible where the disciples or anyone that truly followed him just went, 
got baptized, and nothing ever changed. So that's where we're really hitting on this. Because I think it's one of Satan's greatest lies out there that says you can just believe and you're fine to go. But I think there's a difference between head belief and heart belief. So I think that's where we have to go. Around 1995, Intel, they, they came out with this Pentium processing chip. And the problem was it was flawed. And what happened was it would occasionally give wrong answers, like once every 27,000 years. Okay, so it's like, whatever, it's just not that big of a deal. They also didn't think it was that big of a deal. And so they covered it up. They didn't tell anybody. And the computer community found out about it and pretty much went nuts on them. And Intel got a really bad name because of this. But the problem wasn't so much as that they didn't tell the people about it. It's just that they really tried to cover it up. And sometimes I wonder if that's what's going on in, in church today with this whole idea of, of you can just ask Jesus in your heart and you're fine, you're good to go. Instead of really saying, because eternity is at stake. Like a computer chip is like, a, whatever, it's not that big of a deal. But when we're telling someone, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, and then nothing ever happens in their life, I think in a way we're being deceptive if we don't tell them, when you come to Christ, you will change because that's what the Bible says that's going to happen. So I think we need to be really, really careful when we do that. Now, I was talking to Rob about this the other day, and he said, you know, that I feel like that was me. When I first came to Christ, he said it was a mental thing. I knew I had to be a Christian in order for us to get married. You know, I knew that, you know, I had to do, you know, the, say the prayer or whatever it was. He said I did, and nothing changed, and our life was a mess for 10 years. And then finally, one day when we lost everything, God just grabbed a hold of his heart, and he said that's when I believe it was a heart thing. So there, so there is a, dis, a um, difference there, so... Um, I just don't want us to be deceived. Okay, now I want to talk about what a disciple really looks like. I found this in Colossians 1-4. It's in your handout. And I think it'll give us an idea of not just believing just with a, a mental belief, but it's something that goes deep into our heart. This is what Colossians 1-4 he says, For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and here's what it is, the leaning of your entire human personality on him in absolute trust and confidence in his power, wisdom and goodness, and of the love which you have and show for all the saints, God's consecrated ones. So being a disciple isn't just this belief in your head. It's this idea of t- saying, Jesus, I'm giving my entire personality, my entire life over to you. And I am going to lean on you for everything. I'm going to trust that no matter what happens, that, that your goodness will cover that. Um, I just think it's this idea that you can't, it's not these two separate lives. Like I can just go to church on Sunday and nothing happens during the week. But this idea of leaning your whole personality, leaning everything onto Jesus, that's what a disciple really truly is. And what it means is that when I have a problem or I have issues in my life and things are just like out of, I just don't know what to do, I don't figure them out on my own. Like I really say, God, I'm trusting you. I'm confident that you're going to help me with this. And everything in my life goes to him. And that's what being a disciple really is. I, I read this with, it was one of our posts we did on Facebook. Corey Ten Boom, it's in your handout. Uh, She says, when a train goes through a tunnel and it gets dark, you don't throw away the ticket and jump off. You sit still and trust the engineer. Now, that is from a woman we talked about her last week that was in the Holocaust, death camp, lost her sister, lost her dad, lost everyone, and all she wants to do is help people that are walking off to the fire to be be killed, And, and yet she can say this because she's leaned her entire personality onto Jesus, saying, God, I don't get this, and this is tough, but I'm totally trusting that you, I'm putting my trust into you for everything that's going on. Now, we had an example of this this week, and this will be kind of weird for me to tell you all this, but we have like a certain amount of money that we get each month, which I'm sure you do too, too. But this last month was just ridiculous. Like Rob comes in, he's like, my tooth hurts, my other tooth hurts. We're like, okay, we'll go to the dentist. Two root canals, we know how much root canals are, crowns are. It was like, serious? So that had to go on our credit card. Um, Dusty had to go to driving school so I didn't like die because when I drove with him. So we had to like teach him how to drive. So that worked out really good. So all of this hit in one month. And when I figured out our bills, I'm like, we're $2,000 short. Okay, that's a lot of money. I'm like, so in 
my natural, without leaning my personality on Jesus, I would be panicked. I'd be like, okay, I can't sleep, and I don't know what I'm going to do, and I, can't, I don't know how I'm going to break this news to Rob, and, what, you, know, and I, you just you panic. But I realize that I, I'm not doing that. I'm taking my personality, and I'm leaning it on Jesus, and I'm saying, God, I have no idea. You know we haven't been out just blowing money. You know we're working hard. We can't pay this bill, and I don't even know how to do it. So last Thursday, Rob gets a call from his brother, and Rob's mom passed away, I don't know, probably about six months ago. And they just now, they, they did all of her final stuff, and everyone got their money, and they split it up or whatever. So that was all done. So Thursday he calls, and he says, uh, Rob, I just want to tell you that as we were going through mom's stuff, we found this extra account. Like, didn't even know she had it. And uh, so I have a check for you. Drum roll, please. How much was it? $2,000. Exactly. Okay, so I'm like, okay, I could have panicked and freaked out, but I'm just saying, God, I'm just going to trust you. And I can't even imagine how that even came out, but it did. And that's just God. And when we put our whole personality on him and trust him for those things, then it grows our faith. The more we do it, the easier that that gets. Now I'm worried about next month. <laughs> But whatever, we'll worry about the next week. Um, But anyway, now, another part of being a disciple before we hit the main point to today is we have to make sure that we're following the right leader. Did anybody see that uh, dateline with that Rebecca Musser, the FL? Yes. Okay. Uh, she is the, she's, uh, she was raised in this cult. This, I think it's the fundamentalist Latter-day Saints or whatever. And they live, they wear the weird long dresses and the hair that's puffy. And, and anyway, she was taught all of her life to obey the prophet because the prophet talks to God. And so when the prophet, whatever the prophet says, you do, because whatever the prophet says is from God. And so what this 85-year-old prophet was doing was marrying all the really young kids, okay? And so he was 85 and she was 19, and he says, you're marrying me, okay? And she's like, she's like okay, now you're raised, she didn't know anything about anything. Like, we don't know anything about sex, we don't know anything about it. it so for her, they do this little ceremony, and she kept thinking in her mind, this is so wrong. But everyone kept telling her, oh, you're so blessed by God because you are marrying the prophet, okay? And the guy says, one, the guy was interviewing her like, did he really expect you to have sex with them at 85 and you're 19? And she said, absolutely. And it was, she said, I was horrified and I was just, it was a bad situation. But think how skewed her feeling is on God because she thinks if this is God who puts me in this situation, like I don't want to believe in him at all. Anyway, she ends up running away. She gets, she gets out. She scales a fence and someone helps her get out of the whole thing after she's been married. But this prophet's son was this Warren Jeffs. And so she's the one who brought down this whole, this whole group. And they found a tape, um, a, a tape of him having sex with a 12-year-old. Okay, it was a nightmare. All under the name of God. And this is your prophet. And these women to this day, this, uh, Jeffs is, Warren Jeffs is in prison, but he's still running this cult from prison. It's, it's shocking. And these women, will, and they're following the wrong leader because someone's told them wrong. They've never opened their Bible. They've never checked it out before. And we have to make sure that we're doing that. And that's why we always say in this study, open your Bibles and read it because we don't want you to be deceived in any way that, you know, the Bible says Jesus is our leader. End of story. If it's anything over and above that, if it's like your church, you're like, I got to join this church to know Jesus. No, you don't. You just need to know him. I have to follow this specific tradition. No, you don't. You just need to know Jesus. So it's all about Jesus being our leader because that's what the Bible says. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He's the only way. So we know that because we believe what the Bible says. Now, I want to talk about uh, going through the verses that we're going to go through in the next couple of weeks. And I want to just remind you that if you're new here and you're just like, I'm just here and someone brought me or I saw a sign and I don't know anything what you're talking about, I want you to know that being a disciple starts out you don't know anything. The disciples, the 12, knew nothing. They were confused and they were arrogant and they were in it for all the wrong reasons. And yet God change their life the more time that they spent with Jesus. So I don't want you to go like, well, I don't feel that way or I don't do those things, so I must not be a a follower of Christ. Well, just hang on because that's what time does for you. So I I think what happens is that you're going to eventually get to the point where you look back and you say, I cannot believe that five years ago I treated that person that way. I 
cannot believe that I acted that way or yelled like that or drank like that. Or I can't believe that. But look at, look at me now in five years. Look at how much God has changed my life from the inside because that's what Jesus does. Dusty is a uh, sophomore in high school. When he was a freshman last year, he kind of scared us because he was, you know, 14, 15. And he, you go into high school thinking, what way is he going to go? Like, is he going to follow Jesus or is he going to follow the world? And we just didn't know. And, and um, thankfully, he's doing the right thing. But yesterday, he, came, he was telling me, he said, Mom, I, I like this girl and we like liked each other. But then we broke up. And then her, she has a boyfriend. It's a whole high school drama. She has a boyfriend, and so I was texting her the other day, and the boyfriend texts me, said, don't, you know, cussing at him, and you, you can't do that, and it's my girlfriend, and I'm going to fight you. And, and it was so cute because Dusty texted him back and said, I am so sorry. Like, I really want you to know, like, I am sorry. I didn't, I didn't you know, I, I don't want to have problems with you. But I think, like, last year, he would have been like, bring it on. Like, let's fight in the parking lot, because he would have thought that was cool. But I see him change in this whole year. We were at the cabin this summer. We were staining the front deck. Rob goes, let's stain the front deck. Okay, I'm a princess. I don't stain front. I don't know what that means. So he's like, well, first we have to sand it. So he hands me a sander, and he's like, here you go, turn it on. I'm like, what do I do with this thing? Okay, so he's like, well, just sand, okay? So I start doing that. But then I got really good at it. I'm like, I'm kind of good at this. I'm kind of an awesome sander. But I think that's what happens when you first become a Christian. You're like, I have no idea what to do. Like, what does this even mean to ask Jesus in my heart? But as you go along and you start going to church and reading your Bible and coming to Bible study and learning, then you're like, oh, okay, this makes sense now. And then halfway through my little sanding issue, the sander, sandpaper split and broke. And I'm like, oh. And it's a pain to put those things back on. So Rob says, well, let me show you how to do it. And I'm like, no, you do it. I don't want to learn that. That looks way too hard for me, okay? But he made me learn how to do it. And that's the same as it is in the Christian life. Because you're going to read something in the Bible and it's going to say, uh, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And you're going to be like, what? Like, I'm going to like my enemies and I'm clearly not going to pray for them. But it's hard. It's hard. And then, but once you get over that hurdle, like I now know how to put sandpaper back on a sander, okay? And when you learn things in the Bible that you do, it becomes easier and easier is what I'm trying to say. So that's, that's what we're trying to do. Okay, first verse we're going to do, Matthew 5, 1. And this is our whole point to today. When Jesus saw the crowds, let me see what time it is, 20 minutes. Uh, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. So the one thing that I want us to learn today is that if we are a disciple of Christ, we have to spend time with him because that's what they did. We will never know him if we don't do that. Like if we get up and we're like, oh yeah, I you know, read a verse out of the Bible and then I go through my day and I spend 30 seconds on that and 23 hours and however many minutes left on the other, we're never going to know him. And so it's really, really important to get in a habit of finding ways to get to know them because back then followers of Jesus, they had a really tough life. They had jobs, and then they had to wander around for miles to find him, and then they had to sit in the hot sun, and then they had to listen. And I, I do often ask myself, would I have done that back then? I don't know. I would hope so. But today, we have so much technology available for us to be able to learn. And this summer, and I realized this after my daughter said she was showing up today, that this is all about you, baby. But it's really about their generation because I, I, the summer when they came home for, um, when they got out of school, it was a lot of just sitting around watching TV and, you know, watching Pretty Little Liars or it's like, hey, mom, we're going to have a, a party on Monday night for The Bachelor or The Bachelorette or whoever that ridiculous show is all about. Okay, everyone watches it and let's come over and see who she's going to pick. And I'm like, they're never going to get together because that's just not the right way you do things, but whatever. So, and then you're sitting there trying to talk to them and they're like going, uh-huh, uh-huh, but then they're looking at their phone because there's like a text that's apparently more important than us. And then Dusty will be like, I'll be like, hey, Dusty, I got something really cool to tell you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Someone is, what does he call it? Someone is attacking my base, okay, on, on their video game. And I'm like, someone's attacking your base. I'm trying to like impart some really cool wisdom to you. Yeah, hang on, mom. My base is being attacked. So, what I realized this summer is that this, this generation, and I would say our generation too, it, they, they'd rather watch 
how the Kardashians deal with life and the Jersey women of however. Like, I don't even know who these people are. And I'm thinking, why are they on TV telling our children how to not act? I mean, please don't act like them because it's horrifying. So I started feeling really, really, really sad for this generation. And, for, and then I started thinking about me too. Like, okay, it's sad for me because we have washing machines and dishwashers and dryers and we don't have to go hang our laundry and scrub them in the lake and we don't you know we can we have all this time on our hands and what do we do with our time and I had to sit back and say what do I do with my time because apparently I like to read a lot of people magazine so just an FYI all these people magazines up here they are are not from my like heathen non-Christian friend that I had to go borrow them from. These are mine, okay? I bought them personally because I apparently care why uh, this bride pushes her groom over the cliff, which apparently, <laughs> and you want to say, we've all felt that way, honey, but, <laughs> but don't do it, okay? Um, and I don't know why we care if Jennifer Aniston ever gets married or not, but we do somehow or other. Uh, so, so we have all of this that just vies for our attention. And, and so I started thinking, okay, what if, instead of pushing her husband over the cliff, she read Max Licato's Every Day Deserves a Chance, okay? Because every day does deserve a chance, and she needs to realize that life is really good and, and, and how to do it. Or, better yet, she could read A Marriage Without Regrets, because I'm pretty sure that she's going to be regretting ever getting married at this point. Um, and then there's a story in here about Oprah and how Oprah lost it. And I'm like, yeah, well, Oprah, you need Jesus. So maybe you need to read uh, about God's shelter from Sheila. Okay, so you get the point. Some of you are like, my husband had an affair and we're going to get a divorce. Well, maybe you want to read Gail Haggard's on why, you, why she stayed. Okay, I, I don't know. We have all of these things available to us. We have iPhone apps. We, have, we, can, we can listen to a- anyone. We can do anything. And yet something makes me want to read my People magazine. Now, don't hear me wrong. Nothing wrong with People. Nothing wrong with watching TV. You can listen to your country western music. Could not care less. Um, This is from the girl who I just watched 20 episodes of Revolution, okay, because I needed to make sure and get it all in before the season premiere tonight, okay? So so I'm not saying this is bad or good and you have to determine that your own self. It was so funny. The other day, just Dusty came in. He goes, Mom, I think my teacher's a Christian. And I said, really? I said, well, she goes, I asked her the other day, I said, are you a Christian? And she said, well, I'm a form of a Christian, okay? I have no idea what that means. He said, but Mom, she was quoting Revolution the other day. And I said, she watches Revolution? And then he just looked at me and Rob goes, do you mean she was quoting Revelation? <laughs> yep, that's what she was doing, quoting Revelation. <laughs> so we, he was watching, yeah, it was a bad deal. It was kind of funny, but it's kind of sad. But anyway, the thing is, is that in our life, we have to get balance. If we're going to read the entire People magazine, let's make sure we have a book next to our bed or something so that we can fill in with our time so that we can learn what it means to know God. Because what goes into our mind is what's going to come out. And if there's no God stuff going in there, I would say, show me a bitter, angry woman, and I'm going to show you what she's filling her mind with. And if you find a woman that hates her husband, and I hate my life, and I hate my job, and I hate everything, she's watching the Kardashians, I'm sure of it. <laughs> okay. But the point is, is that whatever you fill your mind with is what's going to come out. I learned this with Dusty. I told you when he first started in high school, I was kind of a little concerned. He listened to really crappy music. It wasn't really good. I didn't know any of this was going on until I got their iTunes thing, and I'm like, explicit, explicit. What is that? Okay, so I had to go delete a bunch of stuff on that, but what, um, what he did was he went to camp this summer. He went to CIY camp, and we were at the cabin staining. We were having him help us, and he had his earphones on. I said, what are you listening to? And he said, Mom, I made a decision at camp to listen to only Christian music, and so he is filling his mind with Christian rap. Okay, whatever. I don't care what it is. As long as it talks about Jesus, we're good to go. But it is so weird that four months later, I was talking to Aaron last week. She said, how's Dusty doing? I said, it is so interesting. He's been so good lately. His sister will not say that. She told me this morning he needs to learn respect. But I think he's been very, very respectful. I said, he's been so nice, and he's been respectful, and he's been, you know, he's just been a really good kid. And she said, what do you attribute it to, to? And I said, what he's been putting in his brain. Like, he's a different child in four months because he's been listening 
listening and filling his mind with the things of God. So if that happens to them, then I think that that needs to happen to us too. Now, I think we need to just kind of make a, you know, make a thing in our brain like, okay, let's, how do I make this work? I'm going to get in my car. What am I going to turn on? I, everyone has iPhone apps or Windows apps or whatever you have. They have so many apps. Andy Stanley has an app. Women of Faith has an app. I just got on their app yesterday, and I found that uh, they were interviewing Jeff Foxworthy. And it was so cute. And I'm like, okay, how did you come to know Jesus? How? And so he tells his whole story. And, and, and what it does is it builds up your faith, and, and you're growing because you're learning what other people are talking about. So I say, find that. Uh, when you're at home uh, cooking dinner, instead of having the TV on, maybe have your little laptop or something next to you and, and put on a sermon. There's millions of them out there. Download Joyce Meyer. Download, I couldn't care less who you download as long, as long as they love Jesus and they teach the Bible. That's all that matters to me. But I was, one of my kids came to me the other day and said, Mom, I'm really struggling with my faith. And it comes back to the same thing. What are you putting in your brain? Are you listening to anything Christian? Are you listening to anything to grow your faith? Nope. Can't help you. Like at some point you have to realize that is what it's going to take to grow up in our faith. Now, I found this website the other day, and if you're friends of us on Facebook, uh, you'll, you'll kind of, hopefully you saw it. It's called gotquestions.org, okay? It is by far the best, the, the best website I've ever found for question and answers. And what they've done is they started this ministry where people would have a question, who is God? How do I come to know Jesus? Any question. Now they're up to 336 thousand questions that people have asked. They send these questions to teams, they pour through the Bible, and they give you a biblical answer with all of the actual um, uh, scripture with it. It's the coolest thing. So I got this idea the other day. Now, when we, we have, we're just shy of, by about 50 people, I think, of hitting 20,000 likes on Facebook right now. So for me, 20,000 people, this is a pretty big base that we have. And if someone says, I like women's Bible study, that usually means I just, I want to know God. I'm so excited about knowing God. So we send two posts a day out, but usually they're very encouraging posts, like something that will make you happy in your life. Like, oh, Jesus is going to take care of your problem. And they're like, 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 okay. So we can tell when, how many people it goes out to. So our biggest post went out to in front of 63,000 people. Okay. I was just totally blown away. So I get this idea. I'm like, okay, this is what we're going to do. In the morning, we're going to put on there, I'm going to put a link to a question. It'll be the question of the day. And it was from gotquestions.org or whatever that is. So I'm going to transfer that on there. And so I did that the first day. And I was so excited to wake up in the morning because I'm like, this is going to be so cool. We're going to have a million people that are going to be like, I was so excited to learn about what God has to say. And I looked on there and there was like 1,900. That was it. And I... Like, it literally broke my heart. Because I thought, here we are, a nation of women that want, want us to, want to be encouraged without realizing that the way to be encouraged is to know your Bible, to know about God and know what he says and know who he is. But no one wants to take that time to do that. They would rather just be over here. I'm not, and I love encouraging. I have no problem with that. I'm not even saying that. But hopefully you get what I'm trying to say. We have this big base of people here. So what I'm going to do every morning is send a question out. And I'm hoping that when that happens, you guys will take that. And if you don't, aren't friend, like, like us on Facebook, and then you'll get those. And then you take those, and then you send it out to your friends. You say, hey, let's study the Bible together. Because this is what Second Timothy says, um, 2.15. It says, study and be eager and do your utmost to present yourself to God approved, tested by trial, a workman who has no cause to be ashamed, correctly analyzing and accurately dividing rightly handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. So he's saying, here's the deal. This is our job. If you and I say, I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm a disciple, what's our job? It's not just to sit around all day long and and, and read People magazine and just live life. It's to study, study, and be eager to study, and be eager to learn. That's just what the disciples did back then. Think about, they met Jesus in three years. They had to pass on everything they knew to a whole entire world. And they did that because they had the answers. They spent the time. They knew everything that Jesus had to say. Look at Matthew 13, 36. He says, then he left 
the crowds and he went into the house, his disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And, and this is this idea that if somebody tells you something and you're like, I don't know if that's true, study it. That's what they did. Like these disciples weren't happy with just like, oh yeah, whatever, I'm just, that's fine. They said, Jesus, we don't understand, but we are desperate to know what that really means. And that's what we're supposed to do as followers of Christ. We went to a church one time. I know I've told this to you. We're sitting there. I'm studying something. I don't remember what it was. And the pastor gets up in front of everyone and says something that I know the Bible doesn't say. And everyone in the crowd was like, yeah, right on. Praise the Lord. Okay, and I'm thinking, the Bible doesn't say that. Okay, you've just told all of these people and no one's going to go study it. And it, it just, it hurts my heart. So we have to be women. And that's why I want women's Bible study to, to really mean that. Like women studying the Bible so that, not that we can get all puffed up and we just know everything, so that we have answers for people when they ask. Cheyenne came to me this summer. She goes to a school where there's tons and tons of Mormons. She's confronted with Mormons all the time. And she finally said, I'm done with not knowing what they believe. So she went to the bookstore, got a bunch of books on Mormonism, and started studying it. She's like, Mom, i got to have answers for these people. And that's what happens when you're a disciple. Like, you're, you're not just content with just like, oh, whatever they believe is fine. No, I want to know what they believe so I can say to them, please, 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 Jesus is the only way to God, and we're desperate for you to come to him. Look at Acts 17, 11. Now, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. They were eager to learn. Now, how many of us, when we go to church, are like, I'm so excited to go to church to learn? Hopefully, all of us. But most often, not, okay? We go because we feel like we've got to get it over and get it out of the way so we can go home and watch the Cardinals play. Whatever. But what I'm saying is that what, if we don't have that eagerness, what do we do about that? Because a lot of you are here going, I don't really care. I, I really don't have any desire whatsoever. And I would say go home and get on your knees tonight and say, God, I want to have that desire. I really want to know you. I want to learn, but I don't have any desire. Would you give that to me? Give it to me so desperately that I can't wait to get up in the morning and say, God, what are you going to teach me today as I open my Bible? Because that's what we do as we're, we're studying. I, I was raised with um, never, ever hearing this word, the doctrine of election, okay? And I, I literally, all my life, Christian life, never knew what it meant. And so someone presented it one time at, um, and asked a question, and it bothered me so bad that it took me a year to figure it out. I cried. I carried on. I, I, I was so upset. Like, I couldn't figure it out, and it made me frustrated and angry and happy, and I couldn't, it was just, but I always say Rob wanted to put me in a, like a theological mental institute because I, that's how crazy I was about it. But until I knew the answer that I could now impart to other people, I wasn't satisfied. And I think that's what a disciple does. It's like we have to be not satisfied with just this. We want to be learners so that we can pass it on. Now, I just want to end real quick because we only have a couple more minutes. I, I put the, these frequently asked questions from, and it's in your hand out there. And I'm going to run through a couple of these questions and then we'll end. Because these are the questions that you may ask and you don't know the answer for. And now we have a great place to go and, and really grasp these questions. Every day on your Facebook, I'm going to send this, these out and, and read them. I was thinking, think about it. If every one of us read one of these questions and answers every day for 365 days, do you know how much knowledge we would have to be able to pass on to other people? Get a load of these questions. How do you explain the Trinity? Why does God allow bad things to happen? What are the different names of God and what do they mean? Does God hear the prayers of unbelievers? Is Jesus God? How can you prove Christ's resurrection? Where was Jesus for the three days between his death and resurrection? Why is the virgin birth so important? What is blasphemy of the spirit? Are miraculous gifts for today? What is the gift of tongues? How can I know what my spiritual gift is? Is there a way to lose your salvation? What about people who never hear about the gospel? Is salvation by faith alone or faith plus works? What is the age of accountability? That's a really interesting question, by the way. So my mom, my, we have some cousins that are Mormon, and my mom went and met with my aunt and uncle. And they asked my mom that question. What, what, what do you believe the age of accountability is? Because the Mormon church says it's eight. 
So like if you died at seven point whatever, you're fine. But at eight, you're not. Okay, and the Bible doesn't say that. So what they're going to give you here is biblical answers on what does the Bible say about that. Okay, we've got one minute. Um, these are just such really good questions. Uh, uh, why are there so many Bible translations? How is the Bible put together? Why should we study the Old Testament? Does the Bible contain error, contradictions, or discrepancies? Why is baptism important? Should we worship on Saturday or Sunday? What does the Bible say about tithing? Why is church attendance important? Important. End time questions. What is the mark of the beast? When is the rapture going to happen? What is the judgment seat of Christ? Uh, and it goes to questions about angels and demons and humanity and theology. And I mean, there it's one after another. Why pray? What is the Lord's prayer? So those are all the questions that that not all of them because there's 330,000 of them. But it gives you an idea that we can now be women and have something on the web. You know, along with everything else, the web and you know, are we going to use it to our advantage? Or are we not going to? And I want us to be women who grow up in our faith, that we have the knowledge so that when somebody, a Mormon, comes to Cheyenne or uh, someone says something to my mom, she goes, I I know the answer because I've studied it and I know it and I believe it because God's word says it. And that's what I think that disciples do. 